So today we're with Jeff from Oricon, Jeff Robinson, who's always been known as the guy who asked the first question. But today we're going to break that tradition and I'm going to be asking the first question. Go for so it, Jeff, in your opinion, why do you think air tightness is something that is more prevalent in the way of construction and commercial and residential in today's day and age? Because it's time has come. Yeah. And uh, what I mean by that is if you look at the how sustainability in the built environment has progressed over the last 20 years from when the Green Building was ca Council was formed shortly after the uh, Sydney Olympics, when we started developing tools like Green Star, when we started developing tools like Neighbours. If you look at the quality of the buildings that were being built at those stages and what was being achieved in terms of energy efficiency, water efficiency, indoor air quality. It was very different to what it is now. I remember a time when Neighbours first came in and you started, uh, and, and a four-star Neighbours rating mm. was a real challenge to be able to go and do. And now, when we're designing buildings, we're aiming for five, five and a half, zero carbon buildings. Mm. So it takes uh, a while in the industry for, um, people to develop the skills and the knowledge. And um, what you're working against in this industry is that, certainly in the commercial building sector, largely we're in a fairly benign climate. It doesn't get that hot, doesn't get that cold, or at least that hasn't been the case. And there, uh, for a long way back, energy efficiency wasn't kind of on the, uh, as one of the, the really important items. So. People had to develop the skills around things like being able to go and improve the HVAC systems, being able to choose them, getting better control systems. Uh, there was a whole technology uplift in terms of things like LED lighting uh, and better control systems. Slowly, the ratings um, started creeping. The other thing that happened in the large commercial building sector is that you got a lot of the large property companies uh, invested in building the skills up of the facilities staff who would actually run those particular buildings. And through that work, we ended up in a situation whereby um, the, uh, the ratings in the neighbors ratings have, have climbed higher and higher. Mm. So once you've kind of sorted out a lot of the HVAC systems, the electrical systems and so on, mm you start looking at the areas that are were harder to change. Yep. And one of the biggest challenges in this industry, there isn't a proud tradition of building well-insulated airtight buildings. Mm. We're the lucky country, mm. energy's cheap, it's a benign climate. Yeah. We don't have or didn't have the kind of uh, necessity uh, to have to go and get uh, building air tightness and insulation right mm. in the same way that some of the European, northern European countries mm. or Canada or America has had to do where it gets very, very cold. But now we're getting to a situation whereby it's going to be hotter and hotter and our equivalent of the very, very cold uh, winters is the extremely hot and extremely large mm. uh, summers. And, um, and people have seen that the buildings we're building at the moment mm are not particularly uh, resilient. So some of the, the, the key things that you know drives me crazy, because obviously uh, insulation and air tightness is something that we just don't, you don't see it. No one can really appreciate it because you don't see it. When you take that into consideration and that there's a HVAC system that's supposed to be heating and cooling this building, how can you understand or size a HVAC system if you've got no understanding about how airtight or how well insulated a building is? I don't think that's a great question, John. Mm. I mean, one of the, the, as an HVAC engineer, I always used to start off, well, the, the, the starting part of the job is not how big the ducts are going to be or where you put the air handling units or what the roots and rises are going to be. Mm. Starting conversation needs to be with the architect or the builder about what way, or sorry, the, the architect or the client about what way is the building orientated? Yeah. Uh, how much glazing is? What's, yeah. What are the shading systems uh, in place? Yeah. But that's not necessarily what everyone does. And sometimes uh, you end up in a scenario whereby, well, we'll just size the kit for what the job is going to be. And if it's big kit, 
then so be it. Yeah. A lot of the um, issues of how much energy and comfort in spaces um, were solved by just putting in plenty of air conditioning, yeah. making sure there's plenty of air movement, and she'd be right. Mm. People only know what they know. Mm. And you know, I think it even comes more in, say, in the domestic sector. Mm. It's amazing the number of people that I uh, um, um, know who have come from overseas. And you go and say to them, so how's it going? And maybe they're there in the winter in, in Melbourne or something like that. Mm. And they go and say, what's with the housing? Mm. It's bloody freezing. Mm. And you go and say, you uh, you know, I remember the very first uh, uh, winter I came to Australia and I was working up on the Conservatorium of Music up in, in Sydney. Mm. I have never been so cold in my life yeah. because the building didn't have, had very, very little insulation in it and uh, leaked like a sieve and there was no heating in it because it's Sydney, it doesn't get cold. Yeah. And so we don't have a, a long tradition of building well insulated airtight buildings and that's where I think there's an enormous opportunity at the moment both in the domestic sector and in the commercial sector to go and change the current paradigm, shift a little bit and to end up with much better quality buildings. Awesome, like the new MCM. Like the new Conservatorium of Music, exactly <laughs> like that, <laughs> which uh, uh, we've had the pleasure of working on with the uh, University of Melbourne, yeah. and uh, which uh, you did the pressure testing on. Yeah. And actually that's an example, One, and you, going back to that question you asked before about you know, why has air tightness become uh, popular? Mm -hmm. Well, um, a whole load of things come together. The first thing is an awareness in the industry that it's the next thing that had to be solved. It's about a number of pioneers in the industry, um, uh, people like yourself, John, um, uh, people like Sean Maxwell, uh, organisations like ATMA, Passive House Association of Australia, people who were plugging away for quite a number of years saying we can do better, we can build better buildings and so on, you know, your time has uh, has come. And what's been fantastic over the last, uh, you know, I'm certainly seeing it over the last two to three years, is that pretty much every building that we have worked on of scale, um, uh, commercial buildings and um, buildings for the, um, uh, for universities, we have said that as part of what you're, uh, part of being able to, proving that you're getting what you paid for, yeah. we want to go and do uh, pressure tests on those buildings. And, you know, organizations like the GBCA coming in and saying, uh, we want, uh, you get credits for doing pressure testing. And now with the new standard saying, that actually is a mandatory credit that you at least have to do it. Now, on all of these things, you start off and maybe it's not perfect. And the first few buildings, uh, I would say that you see that are done using these kind of, uh, that are where pressure testing has come, maybe the results aren't great. But it's like anything, if you haven't done something new, uh, you're doing something new and you haven't done it before, first time round, you're not going to be that flash at it. Yeah. But the very fact, you know, for, when you ever get on your bike, you know, hardly anyone gets on and goes straight like that. They wobble like mad. So there's a lot of people wobbling on the uh, on their on their building designs. I mean, are you starting to see that things are getting a little bit better in terms yeah. of the knowledge of of contractors? So now that's the the next thing that I thought think we really need to talk about, and Joseph, in the way of air tightness and it being almost an afterthought in a lot of these projects. Well, um, let's take it this way. Um, Jeff, do you think it's fair to say throughout the last 20 years of energy efficiency and sustainability progression in the building industry, we have almost exhausted all the bells and whistles that we put on in the mechanical system, electrical system, um, a lot of um, featured design of the building um, form and shape and a lot of the consultants and practitioners start to question some of the underlying assumptions such as we assume the building is reasonably airtight, we assume the specified insulation is being installed properly and once we start looking at those assumptions we've started to 
click why a lot of the predicted performance of early stage green building doesn't match with the uh, neighbor's rating. 100%. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, no, well, I'm starting to see that. Look, some of the early days of Green Star and neighbors and things like this, I think we were a little bit obsessed with kit. I mean, we went through those kind of areas where, you know, in order to go and get a, a, a six star rating, you needed to go and have a cogen plant <laughs> and you needed to go and have a black water plant. Yeah. And, you know, things that just weren't appropriate. And, yeah. you know, I can point to loads of cogen plants that once the gas price shot up yeah. and they saw the cost of maintaining those yeah. kind of buildings, they're just being turned off. Yeah. And, you know, things like blackwater plants. I mean, blackwater plant at an individual level is not appropriate. Yeah. The bugs die at the weekend and, and you end up in a situation where it's very expensive to be able to go and maintain those things. If you're going to do, if you're going to do a blackwater plant, do it at scale. Ooh. Do it like Lend Lease did for Barangaroo, yeah. you know, at, 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 at real scale for on those things there. Correct. Individual so, so I think it's a really, really exciting time uh, at the moment because a lot of clients, whether they're university clients like the University of Melbourne or, or Monash or Swinburne, they're all declaring that they want to go and have um, zero carbon targets. Mm. And when you sit down and kind of work out how you're going to get there, mm. and similarly, um, sorry, organizations, all of the major property funds have all declared to go and say that they're going to achieve zero carbon as well. The, and the other thing, uh, building on what you were saying, Joseph, is that if you think about it, a lot of the early stuff, the progress was about kit, it was about better design, it was about things like this. Well, there's not going to be that much more you're going to be able to squeeze out of lighting, even out of chillers, out of control systems. We're going to hit a, a kind of a limit to those things. So, so what you then have to address are the bits that we're not doing so well. And the bits we're not doing so well is getting the fundamental detailing and design of buildings for insulation and, and air tightness right. If you get those right and you get them performing better, your comfort's going to go up, the energy use comes down, the size of the kit that you have to put in to do uh, the HVAC and so that comes down. I mean, it's potentially a golden age for sustainable architecture. On top of that, like it's a building that lasts a lot longer and it just keeps working for you. 100%. Whereas all these other kit that you were talking about before, it needs maintenance, it needs to be continually fed in order to give something back. So the building envelope, we get that right and it's giving to us pretty much for for, for the life of the structure. Yeah, which 100%. will be a very long time. So the challenge in the industry ha has been that it's kind of set up to build quick, to build fast, mm. and to build cheaply. And what we have to do is we want things still to be cost effective, and we will still want people to be able to build quickly, mm. but we just have to shift the paradigm a little bit and to educate the industry that to have better componentry and a better understanding. And we need the design professions to work really closely together. We need the structural engineers, the architects, the facades engineers, the HVAC engineers, the ESD consultants to come together um, and to work in a way whereby um, you're, we're ending up with a better and more integrated design uh, result. And one of the things, I mean, one of the my kind of pet hates in the industry is that oftentimes when we come on a project, everything becomes a very um, siloed thing, you know, sort of, and I, I think sometimes, you know, people say, oh, well, the sustainability, I'll just focus on such and such a credit. And, it, you know, people end up sort of sitting down and focusing on individual broken down credits, as opposed to standing back and saying, guys, how are we going to do a really sustainable building in a really cost-effective way by getting multiple benefits from single pieces of construction? And so a lot of the time what we're seeing is that if you use, say, something like an integrative design process whereby you have a series of workshops where the engineers, the architects, the quantity surveyors are all in the room at the same time solving 
particular problems in a really integrated way with all the right kind of tools, the, you know, the parametric modeling things with uh, you know, uh, real-time cost information coming in, it means that we start, rather than this kind of siloed approach and this broken down thing, you end up looking at things from a whole systems basis, you get a better result for less money. And uh, we've certainly seen that uh, coming to fruition on projects like the uh, Woodside building mm -hmm. um, where we worked uh, for Monash University, where ourselves and Grimshaw and Slattery and Monash all worked together in a very integrated way to go and uh, deliver a building that is targeting um, uh, a passive house rating. And um, I think that has got to be the way of the future. If we want to get high performance, we need to be working um, uh, much more in, in a much more integrated way. We need to be bringing in the trades really early, getting contractors involved early. And we also need to be signaling to the industry that this is going to happen at scale. Now, if the whole industry is saying that everyone's going towards kind of passive house standards, then you're, you, instead of being a very niche thing where you're paying for kind of niche type products, actually it becomes the whole industry is demanding uh, thermally broken, um, high performance uh, facade systems and sealed doors and are looking and, and solving the common problems around uh, the design of the HVAC systems. Yep. And that's where I think scale is going to be so important. Mm -hmm. And I think, I, I feel very, very optimistic that uh, that's happening. Um, mm -hmm. I've spoken to a number of the, uh, the um, uh, Property Council Sustainability Committee and a, uh, there's a, a, a lot of consensus in that committee that the next, uh, you know, the next couple of years are around high performance envelopes targeting zero carbon uh, um, zero carbon buildings. So it's, it's a really exciting time to come up. One of the questions I wanted to ask you both is this, you guys are doing so much testing, both in the domestic sector and in the commercial sector. I think you would probably have the best understanding of where the industry is at. And I'd be really interested in understanding what are the what are the design challenges you're seeing? What is it that the architects and engineers and developers need to understand about fundamentally how do we uh, rethink the way in which we can design our commercial buildings or uh, education buildings, large scale ones, in a way which may, means that it will be uh, give us the best chance of uh, getting well insulated airtight buildings. What are the kind of biggest challenges you're seeing? Well, I think at this point in time, the industry is not really geared up or skilled up in both the design, the designer, architects and consultants, and also the builders and trade to um, tackle a lot of the airtight system that is available overseas. Well, one of the key examples that we can say is um, in Europe and in the US, a lot of the air tightness is controlled by building wrapping. But up to this point, the application of um, building wraps in Australia that we've inspected can vary a fair bit. This is mainly due to the skill of the labor, the trades actually installing the product. So um, what it comes back to is for the designer, depends on the scale of the building. If we are talking about domestic, as long as the client is willing to pay a bit extra to hire the skilled labor to do the installation, they should not have much issue. But in commercial building term, because of the large scale, the available skill um, trades that can do the job may not be available for the project. Yeah. And in that, you either need to spend extra time and money to training and upscale, upskill the trade force, but while the, um, the builder may be willing to do that, but the high turnover of trade during the pro process of building a decent sized commercial building make it 
even harder to maintain the continuity. Yeah. And it also feeds back to the designer, whether they can simply adopt or borrow design details from our overseas counterpart is questionable in some cases. One, the skill level of our trade may not be there. Second, the availability of certain material may not be readily available in here. Some, even the system, key system components are not available here. You either make it a very expensive exercise to tailor, made and ship it across for one project, or you need to think about alternative. But having said that, this would be a, um, a hindrance in the progress, but with more and more airtight building, airtight design, the availability of material and system we can see would genuinely solve itself and more and more um, system will be available here. Just look at double glazed window. Absolutely. 15 years ago, it was crazy to ask for one unless you use it for acoustic purpose. And now you can hardly ask for a window system that does not contain double glaze. The same process would go through for a lot of the system from what I can see. Look, I, I mean, I think you're right, Joseph. One of the things that um, you know, I can see an enormous opportunity and it really came home to me um, during thinking about uh, what was happening at the bushfires and where mm. our climate is heading to, that we actually need to be uh, focusing on building more resilient buildings. Yeah. And through that very process, we can also help reduce our carbon emissions. Mm. So um, I think there is an one of the things that I think has been great to see, uh, and hats off to the uh, Building Controls Board and so on, um, uh, that uh, they brought in um, uh, pressure testing, mm. uh, both commercial and domestic buildings in the 20 uh, NCC uh, 19. Mm. And that means that you can, there's the ability to go and prove that you're getting a well insulated airtight building by, by running the tests. I think there's an enormous opportunity that for the 2023 uh, revision yep. to actually go and say to the industry, uh, we're going to bring in mandatory pressure testing. Yeah. You, we have three years for the industry to gear itself up for that. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that, it's, it's training for engineers, architects and building designers mm -hmm. on how to detail the facade systems, the HVAC systems, all of those components, mm -hmm. how that can come together. Mm -hmm. It's about um, you know, helping people like the HIA and the master builders, maybe by giving some money towards those organizations to help them train the many, many um, trades. Uh, trades out there. And I think this is an enormous opportunity for uh, the industry to take a really uh, giant leap in terms of learning new skills that are going to mean that uh, they're coming up to world standards. Because if you go and have somebody who's you know, working in something in Australia and they want to go and work in a country where there's an expectation around insulation and, and air tightness, that's harder to be able to go mm -hmm. and, and, and have those kind of skills. And I think one of the things that I think is that by actually having that uh, a, a, a known target coming up and having the industry coming together, we can move to a situation where the whole industry skills up. And just as you were saying, Joseph, you know, all of the kinds of uh, componentry, whether it's um, uh, uh, heat recovery ventilation systems mm -hmm. or thermally broken double glazed windows on, and doors and so on, those, if they are purchased at scale, maybe it gives an opportunity for an Australian industry to go, mm -hmm. but or certainly it, 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 if we're choosing to import, which in a lot of times sometimes we are, mm -hmm. that it is actually saying, well, Australia is now signaling that we that they are buying better quality products mm -hmm. and things coming in. If that happens at scale, it doesn't have to cost any more yeah. because we get the same kind of competition. We're just buying different quality and. 
I, I, there's no downside on the on, on this thing here. We we don't have to get involved in the climate wars or whether it's coal versus the you know uh, electricity and things like oh sorry yeah or renewables. We can all get together and agree that actually everyone would like to go and have a well insulated, airtight building that's comfortable to be in. And sure, there's lots of things that'll have to be do about understanding about how we design. Uh, getting people to understand about wrapping and insulation, mm -hmm. but that's a great opportunity. And exactly. there are the people in the industry, people like Efficiency Matrix, people uh, in the Passive House Association mm -hmm. with the skills to get that to happen. Absolutely. I think the other thing that really needs to be focused on as well is, I mean, there's a lot of work to, to be done working up to the final product, which we've sort of touched on, mm -hmm. but then the policing the, the auditing at the end is critical to, to just to, to give it some teeth. Absolutely. To make, to make change actually occur. So auditing, insulation and consistency, how many jobs have we been to where apparently the insulation was picture perfect when it was put in, but then after trades have gone through all the insulation, putting in their services, doing whatever they've got to do, everything is a dog's breakfast yep. after that process has and, gone through. And again, I mean, and airtime, is ra 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 rather than being on the kind of negative, you know, uh, to the builder side of things, mm. people only know what they know. Yeah. And uh, the opportunity is to train people about the sequencing, to have respect for the other trades and to know that at the end of the day, the building is going to be pressure mm. tested. And if it leaks, mm. there will, you and there's a, a requirement to pass at a certain level, mm. that plasterboard will be coming down yeah. and that you'll be going to do these things. It will not take the industry long yeah. to understand that actually we need to get this to, together and we need to work mm. as a team. Mm. And if I go and uh, you know put a big hole into the mm. Uh, I I into a membrane mm. to go and run a conduit in because I've forgotten to do it later yep. on. It's on me to go and fix it up yep. and, and, and to tape it up and to sort those things or not to let that happen because yeah. the it's sequencing is better. It's going to be challenging up front. Yeah. But all of us, when we learn a new skill, like, mm. you know, who... Uh, who of us have ever got up on a bicycle for the first time and it was picture perfect the first time they got in? We all wobbled on the bike, mm. okay? Well, there's a lot of wobbling going on in yeah. construction around air tightness at the moment, but the wobbling's decreasing and, and, and people are starting to get better and better. And that's where I think uh, it's a really, really exciting time. That's uh, absolutely correct. Um, in addition to that, I think a lot of trades and construction managers, they get into this area with good faith, believing their the way that they built should be reasonably airtight until they see when we do the test, the number doesn't seem right in their mind. And then we had a discussion with them. It's an eye opener to a lot of them. And some more um, strong opinion um, team members, they initially refuse to believe the results until we start showing them smoke how and where the smoke keep coming out from the building, then they suddenly have a complete change of heart. In the next project, we get in contact with them again. They are a completely different person. I believe a lot of the tray and Experience. builders, it just, they don't, they never experience that. Yeah. yeah. Just to your point, I mean, even at a domestic level, because people's expectations around comfort have been um, tuned by what they've grown up and experienced, yeah. mm -hmm. their expectations aren't very, very high. So, it, you know, if it's leaky, if there's an enormous amount of, uh, uh, you know, really windy air conditioning mm -hmm. in different spaces and huge amounts of heat gain coming in, well, isn't that what it's like? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's only when you go into buildings that have been designed to say something like Passive House, or or close to that you understand what that it you don't need vast amounts of kit to be comfortable yeah. in in a building and so I don't blame people who uh, who go and you know it's not built well from the, you only know yeah. what you've learned and that the enormous opportunity mm -hmm. is to take people on the journey and I you know it's interesting I really thought about this to say that you know we also need to go and 
if you know get house holders people who are going to build their new house or do a renovation or something like that to understand a little bit more about what the opportunity is mm. to around better comfort better insulation and things mm. like that you know maybe we need do you remember they had the black balloons campaign oh, yeah. which which showed you know uh, it showed carbon as a kind of a black balloon yeah. mm. well i thought of an idea of saying you know you 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 have a house and you have you know the the two kids and the cuddly dog and they're all sort of mm. sitting there and they're looking at you know, $10 notes zipping out through gaps in the walls or between this, that and the other, mm -hmm. to educate people that buildings are, if you look at uh, a, a plaster boarded wall and you look up there and you think, oh, that's fine, it's all grand, but you're not looking, you're not able to go and see where the air is leaking mm -hmm. out and, and, and going out through, you know, uh, evaporative air conditioning mm -hmm. systems or in through the ducted heating systems and things of like that. And I think, you know, one of the fantastic things, and absolute kudos to you guys, the videos that you guys are making are just fantastic in showing householders that they can make those kind of choices. I, I mean, I, I, I would love to see your videos being looked at by anyone who was contemplating yeah. getting a new house and, yeah. and to go and say, as p a part of what I, uh, of, of getting my new house, I want a mandatory pressure down, yeah. test done. Because as far as I'm concerned, it's one of the, it's the absolute best value money you can ever do is yeah. to get a pressure done. Mm -hmm. Signal to your builder right up front, I want a pressure test done. Mm -hmm. I want it done by good people like Efficiency Matrix. And, um, and you'll get better trades. You'll, yeah. you, if the builder knows that that's going to go and happen, mm -hmm. you'll get people who are at the top of their game coming in. Totally. And it'll be the best money you ever spend in terms of that kind of uh, uh, quality coming in. Yeah, and John, do you remember we did have a discussion with one of the passive house builder that they should start a passive house Airbnb oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. for their clients to live there for a week That's to a experience yeah, the yeah, difference yeah. between their current house yes. and a passive house. Yes. That's a great idea. Yeah, no, actually, or maybe, yeah, you, you exactly, you yes, should go and get, get, the, get clients before they try before you mm. buy. Spend mm. a bit of time there. That's a great yeah, idea. Yeah, yeah. So, Jeff, when a building performs poorly, especially in the way of a commercial building, so if we've got a big, tall building, which in essence, it's basically a big chimney, mm. they can suffer from reverse stack effect when it's hot outside, stack effect, high winds uh, during windy days, especially at the top of the building, negative pressure on the top, positive and negative on either sides of the building, HVAC imbalances because people aren't comfortable, and then they feed on all the other <laughs> effects that might be occurring. How do you see that affecting uh, the systems inside some of these big buildings? Well, big there, it, it's, it's affecting um, both energy performance, you know, fans are having to run harder or, your, um, uh, you know, air is leaking out of the building or uh, it's uh, uh, affecting um, issues of comfort, you know, that things get out of balance. and. Um, so when we're doing a design for a building, I think we really have to fundamentally think about saying, uh, how do we design for air tightness? What are the pathways? Uh, where, where is air going to leak out? How are we designing for services penetrations? What are we doing in terms of sequencing? Are we designing for thermally broken frames and so on? Yeah. And we, we really need to think that from an end-to-end -end point of view. I think the other thing to do is to also think uh, about designing for commissioning. Yeah. And if one of the key things is going to be, if you're going to be yeah. relying on being able to get a good result in terms of air tightness, I think yeah. that's going to become more and more and more. People are going to increase standards and people there's going to be an expectation on that. I think people don't understand some of the fundamentals about how you actually set about the process of pressure testing and the kinds of things that you need in place. And maybe, mm -hmm. Joseph, would you tell us a little bit about the kind of you know, things like pinch points and, and, you know, understanding your air barrier lines and things like mm. that. Can you also, tell us about that? Also dampers on HVAC systems yep. and the, the lack of them in a lot of cases too. I think that's critical. Well, usually when we're conducting air tightness testing on large commercial building, 
there are a couple area that limited by the design. One, the number of um, doorway that is connected between inside and outside. These are the only area we can set up our calibrated fan to measure how much air we pump into the building to achieve certain pressure that we required. The second is the path for air distribution. Usually for non-purposefully designed building, we can only use the stair and lift core mm -hmm. as the air distribution path. And most of the time, we would try to avoid using the lift core because we need to provide safety on barricading the open lift door throughout the entire process, mm -hmm. which most builders would try to avoid that kind of risk. And if the building doesn't have a large atrium that restricted the airflow between different floor and the even distribution, which makes the process a lot harder. Mm -hmm. Last but not least is um, all the mechanical system, how easily they can be isolated from the ambient. Usually it's be part of the damper, but um, for a lot of the older building, the fresh air damper, they have a certain minimum fresh air requirement in, and they can't be shut fully. And for those cases, we need safe access to be able to temporarily seal up those access points. And a lot of the time, um, apart from a few new buildings, the kitchen and toilet exhaust system doesn't have damper at all. Yeah. Um, and we can only do temporary physical sealing to enable us to do the, the testing. But sometimes they may not be in a safely accessible position. Mm -hmm. So we need to get someone with harness and suitable tickets to do the work for us that can significantly impact the course of performing a test. Mm -hmm. And ha since we are on that note, I also want to suggest a lot of um, team, design team and building owner to consider not only testing the air tightness at the completion mm -hmm. of the building, mm -hmm. but also plan for a retest every five to 10 years because of all the potential upgrade, yeah. change of fit out, that may damage the um, air barrier in the building. And if that changes, you need to make ratification or adjustment to your mechanical system to compensate for that. How about aquatic centers? Aquatic centers. Is <laughs> this is a painful story. It, it is a completely different kind of beast. I mean, potentially they should be probably retested on a regular basis in five years though. Well, I think five year retesting is, is um, very paramount because of the very specially um, hostile environment with correlated humid air that can potentially get into the structural member mm. if the um, vapor and air barrier is damaged. I mean, cost effectively, the these aquatic centers, they should be built to a passive house standard. I mean, they'll last so much longer. The amount of money these aquatic centers use in energy, but also you for, you have to rip off the roof and replace it from on a regular basis. It's is very, very difficult to convince the um, cost controller and the financial planner in the first instant. Yeah. But with more and more um, aquatic center mm. has been completed with high performance of yeah. um, air leakage mm. and also with some degradation happened in the older yeah. centers. I think we see more and more project team yeah. that even before they start chatting with us, yeah. they already chosen to use um, sandwich panel yeah. as roofing instead of uh, the more traditional stick and um, metal deck roof yeah, that make it very, very challenging to create that air and vapor barrier. Yep, we, we, we already seen in five, 10 years ago is usually one in 10 mm. aquatic center that would have sandwich panel. Mm. Now is the flip side only those aquatic center designed by inexperienced team would try to use metal deck roof. Can I ask one question? Um, one of the things I'd like you to talk about is this issue of uh, 
the kind of scale that you need to be able to do pressure testing of long uh, of large buildings. Mm -hmm. I've heard of other situations where other organizations perhaps have maybe not, maybe you could talk a little bit about how much kit you have mm -hmm. and what that enables you to do and what, you know, folk who haven't got the same amount of kit, what that kind of forces them to do. So we've got over 20 uh, commercial grade blower door fans. So yeah, that allows us to test extremely large buildings, especially at a permeability rate of five. When it comes to how big we could test, we could test the Rialto at a permeability rate of around about three. Uh, two. Two? Two. If, if, they, if Rialto Tower can meet passive house requirement, we can test it the whole building at one go. Testing buildings to a permeability rate of 20, to a certain extent, in a lot of cases, is actually impossible. Uh, just because of pinch point issues, mm -hmm. by the time you're inducing, say, 25 pascals at the vicinity of the fans, the pressure drop is so great at the extremities, it would drop to 10 or maybe even 5 pascal. Mm -hmm. It's not a compliant test. The mm -hmm. all pressures throughout the whole building need to be within 5% of the pressure of the induced pressure. Mm -hmm. So leakier buildings, no matter how many fans you've got, they're actually, to a certain extent, impossible mm -hmm. to test, to test ac accurately. So a lot of the high-rise buildings, they're usually split up into, or they're split up by a plant room. So they're basically a building on top of a building. Mm -hmm. And they're, they're usually like HVAC zones. But Joseph, I'll let you go into compartmentalized testing, which, which isn't ideal, and that's where you use internal surfaces as an air barrier. The ideal case to deal with large building is to test the entire building at one go yep. with enough fans that's set up in a distributed fashion. For, for example, like a 35-story um, commercial building, we would set up fans on the roof level to pump into the stairwell, yep. and then in the any intermediate plant room level to also suck air in from the ambient, and then the ground, and potentially in the basement level if there is an uh, vent, openly ventilated car park. So we can get um, air from different points and even it distributes to reduce the pathway of air needs to go through. That's the best way to test because it, um, it won't have any internal leakage through areas that are not supposed to be airtight to start with. But for other players that may not have enough fans to do that, I think the first option for them is to ask around the industry to try to borrow or hire until they get enough fans to do it the ideal way. Mm -hmm. But in some other scenario, for example, like um, in hospitals, where they always have stage handover, even if you have enough fans, you can't test the entire hospital at one go, then what to do? The second best option is to test fire compartment. Mm -hmm. Because usually a fire compartment is required to have fire and smoke tight construction. Yeah. And from our point of view, a smoke tight construction should also be airtight. So we virtually testing a building within a building mm. that doesn't have any boundary that are not supposed to be airtight. Mm. And then we use the same principle, try to distribute the fans as evenly throughout that portion of the building as possible. Okay, if we can't even get to that size, what we should do is what we call a pressure equalization test, or we call it guarded blow guarded door test. pressure neutralization. We test a portion of the building, but we use one additional floor or one additional zone. So we pressurize that smaller zone to the same pressure as the test zone to eliminate any air going between the guarding zone and the test zone. So it, by the same token, we try to eliminate any leakage that is not going through the designed air barrier. And the worst case a tester can do is just pick one room and then run a compartment test, what we call a unguarded simple compartment test. Usually the only time we would do that type of the test is during the extremely early stage of a project where they completed a small section of the building. And the purpose for us to do that kind of the test is just to show the tray and the site staff where could be the source of leakage. Gotcha. It's more 
quali qual qualitative than quantitative. So you pressurize, fill it full of smoke, and you can see it coming yep. out the facade. Or, or you could you could also do compartment testing with apartments. Yep. <laughs> but that's about it. Because I mean, the other confusing or, thing. Or, or, or the other. There's only one type of building that we are happy to do compartment testing, which is apartments, mm. because each apartment should be able to contain the odor, pollutants, or air within. Yeah. Do you do much apartment testing? We've done a few. Mm. Yeah. Um, but the other thing is, how do you assign surface areas for a compartment test? You know, it's 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 impossible. Well. There are guidelines in the standard that we should only use the actual building envelope surface area. Any internal surface should not be included. Which means, I mean, you're not even going to get a leakage rate of 20 meters well, cubed per hour. If, you, if, if you're just testing a room in an intermediate floor, mm. you are only able to use roughly 20% of Jeez. all the surface and then, area. And in all the of these other walls are not designed to be airtight. Yep. So <laughs> You've got a much worse yeah. result. You should have a much worse result, yep. correct. Jeff from Oricon, thank you very much for seeing us. Absolute it pleasure, John. And great uh, conversation. Thanks, thanks very much to, to you and Joseph for coming in and, yeah. and having a chat. We're massive fans of uh, um, focusing on uh, designing well insulated airtight buildings and it's great to go and have people out there in the industry who not only do a great job in terms of um, the pressure testing and sharing your knowledge but actually are folk who are trying to change the industry if you haven't seen the efficiency matrix videos do yourself a favor uh, google uh, youtube efficiency matrix um, I think there's at least four hours of video. I think I've seen them all and uh, you learn a lot. So <laughs> thank you, John and Awesome. Jessica. Thanks a lot. Cheers, mate. Thank Thanks. You.